It is the holy grail of true crime, the murders of Tupac Shakur and Biggie Smalls. There's two camps. On one hand, we have Russell Poole, Randall Sullivan, and Nick Broomfield. On the other, we have Greg Kading, Darren Dupree, and the LAPD. Because of this recent arrest of Keefe D in Vegas, I do believe this opens up Pandora's box for us to solve the Biggie Smalls murder. Will you join us today, exclusively on Cinemills TV, as we tackle the greatest hip hop murder story of all time? We've got Chris Todd. Thank you for coming. It's great to see you again as we tackle inside the rap rivalry that led to the murders of Tupac and Biggie. This is a case with a lot of moving parts, and you're going to help us sort this out and hopefully provide some solace to the families of Tupac Shakur and Biggie Smalls, a.k.a. Christopher Wallace. Uh, Most of our audience understands the complexity of the case but if you could just bring us up to speed with the Tupac situation, and then we'll work our way into Biggie and how it's all interrelated. Yeah, thank you for having me here. I'm honored to talk about this case. I'm really excited about this and nervous in a way too, and I never say that about cases. Um, The Tupac and Biggie saga and journey is fascinating. I grew up with it. A lot of the people that are watching this grew up with it in the 90s, even late 80s as these guys started out. And Right now, yes, we have the arrest of Keefe D, Dwayne Davis. And, you know, I was lucky enough to source some materials to the media before he was arrested. Um, There were some podcasters and journalists that were integral in getting him arrested, sort of, and also helping to solve the murders, I feel. And just because the police don't arrest somebody doesn't mean we didn't solve this murder years ago, okay? So, in short, Keefe D is... Looks like he's gonna go to trial unless he cuts some kind of plea deal. This is almost a 30 year old cold case, the murder of Tupac Shakur in Vegas in 1996. And people have talked about Keefe D for a long time. Baby Lane, Orlando Anderson, um, Dre and T Brown were in the car. There were four guys supposedly. And, uh, but I do believe Baby Lane is the killer trigger man of Tupac Shakur, as do many people. And I think it's fascinating to see what happens. And I think all the fans, obviously families deserve justice, but I think our country deserves justice on Tupac. And this is gonna open the door. This is the elephant in the room for us to solve Biggie Smalls' murder. Now, Keefe D proffered um, to Greg Kading and another LAPD officer uh, with his attorney present. And does that proffer give him immunity or does Las Vegas PD have full latitude to go in and, and they obviously arrested him, but can he be convicted based on his proffer? Or was it everything he said on other podcasts that sunk his ship? A little of both. The, the queen for a day, we'll call it, or the proffer by the U.S. attorney, that was a federal task force and a federal case and with LAPD, not Nevada. So Clark County as the jurisdiction, and that's why they arrested Keefe D. They never agreed with the feds at all. And if you know what you do, know a lot about you know, criminal procedure and attorneys and judges, look, sometimes this stuff becomes a rivalry and Vegas was embarrassed on this, Clark County, for almost 30 years, they did nothing. They did not investigate this case. I don't care what anybody says, I can prove they didn't. 
okay? Now they're ready to drop the hammer and Keefe D's right in the crosshairs. They don't need, this is their jurisdiction. What Greg Kading and Darren Dupree did, that's not Vegas. That's not Clark County, nor are the feds. So they're gonna take a little pride here and I give them courage. I, I think they're courageous for, for doing this. You don't see a lot of cold cases reopen like this. But let me ask you this, if Keefe D just kept everything he said in the proffer, would and not spilled the tea on any platforms, would he be, would he have immunity? I think, I think the perception would be he's more protected if he didn't go on the two podcasts and say in detail, describing the shooting of Tupac Shakur. You're absolutely right. He should have kept his mouth shut, let it stay with Greg Kading, because here's the thing, Kading didn't have permission to take that tape home. That's not his. That's the property of the LAPD and the U.S. Attorney's Office. That's not Greg Kading's. He never should have been able to release that. So I'm doing a shot across the bow on Greg Kading today in a couple different ways. So you think Kading put Keefe D in a cross, right? Well, Keefe D was trying to get out of a PCP and drug conviction with his family. So he couldn't really provide anything on the Biggie Smalls murder. But he said, well, when I tell you this, you're going to be shocked. And what he, what he revealed was, I'm going to tell you, killed Tupac Shakur. And who did he say killed Tupac? His nephew, Orlando Anderson, a.k.a. Baby Lane. Okay. And was that after the Mike Tyson incident where they got in the tussle? Is that, was that a retaliatory kill? Yes. Okay. That was, that was you know, we're, and you can talk about this other celebrity that you'll bring up where, oh, was this premeditated? Was this set up? Or was this perfect timing? Like it was premeditated. And then when Tupac knocks um, Baby Lane to the ground, right? And punches him and Suge and everybody jumps in on the fight, that gave them the perfect opportunity. Let's get this sucker, right? Now we have a reason and we know who gave them the gun because they said they didn't bring their guns with them out to Vegas. Keefe D says that. I didn't have any we ammo, any weaponry. And who gave him the gun? Zip Martin. And Zip was a Harlem drug dealer that had a very close mm -hmm. connection to Puff Daddy, right? Yep. Okay. And the Crips and the Keefe D. And that's, you know, Zip died. But that's all be, been coming out and that's on the tape. When you listen to Greg Kading's interrogation and Darren Dupree of Keith of uh, Keefe D, he tells you about Puffy's involvement with saying, oh, I want to get rid of this problem. Can you guys help me? You know, you're not going to find this written on a contract somewhere. It's kind of verbal. So I don't think Puffy's in any type of legal issue, but there definitely is some urban legendary that came out of Keefe D's mouth saying that Puffy did want Suge and or Tupac gone. Okay. So it was in Puff's best interest to knock down Suge and Pac, right? The way it's been told in the books and the documentaries and all the research and all the deep dive, Sean Combs was scared that he was gonna be killed by Suge Knight or one of Suge Knight's guys. But does fear alone create circumstantial support that Puff actually put a bag on, on Suge's head and, and Tupac's head? Let's remember the culture of what these guys exist in, okay? These are badass dudes. They got a lot of money. They have a lot of fame. They have power. When these guys roll up, say Suge Knight rolled up to your studio, 30 guys show up with him that could start in the NFL. Are you going to open your mouth to him? You're not. I've done rap videos. I worked at Nickerson Gardens. They will roll deep. I'm fascinated with the culture. I am. Now, how do you explain away the Puff Daddy connection to this, that just simply he was in fear and he did have a relationship through Zip with Keefe D and the Southside Compton Crips? Correct. And he needed the Crips because remember, they're the rivals of the mob Piru or the Bloods. You know, I don't want to sound like a gang expert here, but you have red versus blue. So he's got blue, right, in New York. He's able to use them to protect Puffy, Sean Combs, however you want to say it, he's on their side. Sean's not with the Bloods. That's that's Suge Knight. That's his game. That's he's got to he has to position himself. He needs help, right? He needs help.
if Keefe D was in the car with Orlando Baby Lane, as many have theorized, and it's been confessed by Keefe D, both on record and off record, how does this all tie in to Biggie Smalls? Okay, so let's 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 touch upon the real story. Let's go back to the beginning. Russell Poole, to me, is a hero. Okay? His book is really good. Randall Sullivan did an amazing job with Russell Poole investigating Suge Knight, the murders, all the players around. Nick Broomfield made his documentary in real time while the book was basically being written and coming out. It's hard to explain. Nick Broomfield is the one who introduced Russell Poole to Valletta Wallace, okay? And it's on tape. So these were the three key figures Not Greg Kading, not Darren Dupree. They came in 2006, okay? Russell was already off. His lawsuit was pretty much, the lawsuit was still lingering because that's why they had Kading look at it. To answer your question, Greg Kading solved Tupac Shakur. Greg Kading did not solve Biggie Smalls. I believe he is covering it up for the LAPD because this was a hit team by ex-LAPD Rampart officers that worked for death row, that set in motion a premeditated hit on Biggie Smalls in 1997. You're theorizing that this was a very established hit team that was outside the Peterson that evening, and the target was obviously Biggie Smalls. And or Sean Combs. And what is the motive behind knocking down Biggie? Well, we know who's starting his own podcast, okay, Suge Knight and he's a legend, household name, and that guy almost talked like a reverend and a preacher. He was very bright, wealthy. He did something miraculous. He created a brand. He's part of our pop culture. Am I gonna accuse right now Suge Knight of setting the hit team in motion? Not really, okay? I I don't know. I don't know who set the thing in motion. Was it Suge Knight? Was it the Mob Pyrus? Was it David Mack on his own? Let's remember what happened in Vegas in 96. Suge Knight's cash cow gets murdered and Suge knows who did it. He know, he saw Keefe D in the car. He knows they did it. Death Row goes down the toilet, literally, right after he goes to jail. Nine years serves five. Death Row is destroyed. There's gonna be payback. They, what Keefe D and Baby Lane did by killing Tupac Shakur, to me, I think it was the greatest rapper of all time. Okay, they caused a problem and a void and cost him a billion dollars, cost that company billions of dollars. It doesn't have to be Suge Knight who's like, get that sucker. There could, how many people wanted to get rid of Biggie and, and Sean Combs once they start to sniff out that Keefe D killed their favorite rapper and their, and their billion dollar brand? Like I said about how they rolled deep. This is a massive group of of men. And also, uh, let's say Bernard Parks says on tape to Nick Broomfield that David Mack and Rafael Perez did work for Death Row Records and other rap artists. Greg Kading says that never happened. So you have two contradictory statements right there, both on tape. So when you look at why is Greg Kading saying there's no evidence, but then Bernard Parks, the chief of police, is saying there is. See, again, this is gonna be this kind of confusing carousel of confusion, right? And I'm not saying Greg Kading did this on purpose. I'm saying his job was to create the doubt in a civil lawsuit, okay, that the LAPD was not involved. Why did Russell Poole constantly say there's a connection? Liga kills Kevin Gaines. It opens up this thing to Suge Knight and that's how it starts. Right, and Liga was an undercover officer and him and Gaines get into a kind of a road rage incident, shootout ensues. Random. Very random, but it turns out Gaines is driving a car that's in Suge Knight's wife's name, is that correct? It belongs somehow to Suge Knight. It's It's like his girlfriend or baby mama or, yeah. And when they roll that log over, all all the things crawl out of it. They start, why does Kevin Gaines know Suge Knight? He's a cop. And then they start to find Reggie Wright and they right way and they see all the cops that are working from Compton. Uh, Kevin Hackey was a key figure too in Nick's uh, documentaries, Kevin Hackey. He worked for Tupac. He was a cop, he went to jail. 
You're going to see all this weird things about these cops going to jail. These are the Rampart boys. Okay. Right. This is the dirtiest cop scandal in history. Right. And speaking of Rampart, we had Ruben Palomares on the show. He was probably the dirtiest of the, of the Rampart division. This is what he had to say regarding Rafael Perez, who's kind of a central figure in the whole scandal. And we talk about that thin blue line of backing up your fellow police officer, no matter what, even in trial. No, you keep your mouth shut, the omerta of police officers. Right. But that, that omerta was violated in your unit by a gentleman named Rafael Perez in 1998. He starts spilling the tea about the unit. And he mentions you specifically as being a troublemaker, a guy they should put, look keep at. Keep your eyes on me, yeah. Yeah, keep your eyes on you. When you got word uh, Perez was flipping, what did all your crash unit, did you guys meet up at the bar and go, were you guys thinking about knocking him off? Yeah, I mean, I'm, everybody was talking about taking him out. They wanted to take him out. They were pissed off because he exposed people, but he didn't have dirt on everybody. He had dirt on his own partner, who was Dirty Nino, who he did some dirt with. But he knew that everybody was doing their dirt, but he had he wasn't hands-on watching them, and he didn't have a case with everybody. But he, could, he knew we were, all, we were all guilty of something, but he couldn't prove a lot of stuff, but everybody was so mad because he exposed the unit for what it was trained to do. It was, it was created for that. So now he's exposed, everybody wants to hurt him. I want to take him out too, everybody did. Your thoughts on Rafael Perez based off what Ruben said, it, is that a, a good characterization of, of Perez? I mean, look, I don't know these guys personally. And you know, I was younger during the 90s and late 80s. The crash unit, I think, started in the late 70s, somewhere early 80s to rid the streets of the gang violence. And that stuff spun out of control. Rafael Perez ended up flipping on 70 officers, 7-0. Okay, just think about that for a second. That's a lot of dirty cops. That's a systemic problem. That's not just Rafael Perez and David Mack and Nino Durden, and we're not gonna say this other guy's name. These guys were badass dudes. They had a badge. They had immunity. How many cops do you see get arrested? You don't. The, the, the blue line, right? The blue wall. They don't get arrested. That's why they knew when they were gonna do this that they're gonna get away with it. The Rampart thing was a once in a lifetime thing, as you know. So yeah, that opened up and blew it. That was, they took it too far, right? If a couple of those guys only did it, they probably never would have exposed Rampart. And you know, Ruben mentioned to us that Rafael Perez ratted on him and only does about four years, whereas Ruben did 14. Right. And Raphael was rolling on the whole the whole crew. Yep, Nino Durden went to jail too. There were other cops that all were fired, lost their ability to be police officers. So, you know, Raphael Perez, they say, was the loose basis for Denzel Washington in training day. They kind of say that's loosely based on him, but Raphael Perez, his partner was Nino Durden. They're the ones who got caught shooting Ovando, and that was the big story. And um, But there were other guys, this was systemic. You know, the gangs, the 18th Street Gang, MS-13, this, this section of LA that they were working. Rafael Prez was taking cocaine out of the, of the custody. He took Frank Liga's cocaine, literally, because he was mad about him killing Kevin Gaines. And when Kevin Gaines was yelling at Frank Liga, he was flashing gang signs. He didn't think he was a cop, okay? Look, in LA, we had Rodney King, OJ Simpson, then we had Rampart. LAPD in the 90s, and probably in the 80s too, was on fire. How do you put Nino Durden on Suge's camp? How do you tie that in? So all of them together, David Mack, Rafael Perez, Nino Durden, and the other name we won't say today, they all, Okay, David Mack grew up with Suge Knight. He is from Compton. He's from his neighborhood. All these guys knew each other, okay? Reggie Wright tries to say he didn't know David Mack. I don't believe him, okay? He says that multiple times. That's not true. They are tied to the rap world as bodyguards, off-duty police officers. They are dealing cocaine. They are robbing banks. They are murdering people. So why is it so far-fetched to think, well, how do these guys get mixed up with the biggest rap label in the world that's stationed right down the street? Look, Suge was a genius, okay? He was. This guy ran this whole show. 
And he had his own DA, Larry Longo. He had his own DA. He signed Larry Longo's daughter as the first white singer to death row. He was a district attorney for LA. So Suge had the whole city in a chokehold. The whole scanners, radios. He's in jail, doesn't matter. He sets Teresa Swan, which is her alias. She, they, Greg Caden gives her a fake confession from Pucci, Wardell Faust. You think, you think Pucci would snitch and write up and sign an affidavit saying, yeah, I killed uh, Biggie Smalls and Teresa Swan helped me and, and no one on the street would find that out? Like, Greg was duped. I'm sorry, he was. And even the LAPD commanders above him knew he was duped. He made up this fake confession. Oh, I wasn't gonna use it in court. It is gonna be used in court because the defense attorney for her, right? And anybody you're trying to pinch on Biggie's murder, they're gonna say, you made, did you make a fake confession and, and label it April 1st as April Fool's Day? Yes, I did. Is that a real lawyer's name, Quad, Quan Wiggins? No. Who gave you permission to write it up? Why did you, why did you do that? Oh, and Teresa Swan, wait a minute. She's a five-time fraud convicted felon. So when you handed it to her and said, is this what happened? She goes, yeah, that's what happened. You believed her? She knows or she knows what she wants you to know. The rumor on the streets is that the man who killed Biggie wore a bow tie. Amir Muhammad. And why do you believe Amir Muhammad was at the scene? We can prove that Amir Muhammad was at the Peterson Museum and we can prove that David Mack was there and Rafael Perez. It's harder to prove that Nino Durden was there, but we have eyewitness testimony on tape, on camera, that David Mack and Rafael Perez were both at the party at the Peterson and there's eyewitness testimony from Gene Deal and everyone likes to vilify this guy, but you've got to use him. Gene Deal saw Amir Mohammed approach the car, okay, in the blue jacket, in the blue bow tie, dressed like a bro Muslim Brotherhood or Fruit of Islam. And also, when Nick Broomfield shows Gene Deal the lineup, he says, that's the guy I saw. Now, why was, why was Gene Deal never shown a lineup by LAPD? Ask yourself that. Now, Gene Deal saying, this is Puff's former bodyguard, he's saying that it was a walk-up, not a drive-by. I don't believe that's true. The black Impala pulls up to Biggie's Suburban and shoots him from inside the car. There's not a shooting, no one's shooting from the sidewalk. I do believe the Biggie Smalls murder was a hit by David Mack, Rafael Perez, Nino Durden, and Harry Billups, AKA Amir Muhammad, and I will name the trigger man. You believe the driver was David Mack? I believe the driver is Amir Muhammad, AKA Harry Billups. David Mack set it in motion with Rafael Perez. They had radios, scanners. This was talked about and another guy said, when I was getting beat up at Death Row Records, or it is at a house party with Shug and some of the Bloods. He goes, these guys were on radios. These guys had scanners, okay? This is a high level operation. So Chris, this is a spider's web of entanglement involving the Rampart crash unit, a bunch of dirty foul cops, Suge Knight, a big time shock caller, a big influential record label owner. You've got Puff Daddy, the whole bad boy record company. And you've got a cast of characters, Amir Muhammad, David Mack, Nino Durden. Tell us how this all was executed and how it went down. I'll tell you exactly how I think it went down. God damn, man. You trying to go back, man. First of all, man, first and foremost, rest in peace to Biggie Smalls, man. That was rest my home. You know what I mean? I had a connection with him, like me and him was way more close than me and Pac. You know, I knew Pac on the affiliation from Dizzle Underground, like, you know what I mean? Associate, you know what I mean? Me and Biggie from paging each other, phone calls and shit. So um, I got to know him on tour, you know what I mean? Basically it was a tour with the, um, with the Loonies, uh, 
Biggie Smalls, Junior Mafia, Mary J. Blige, Joe to see Naughty by Nature, and so on, so on. Um, so um, anyway, long story short, of the tour, we get kicked off the tour and shit, doing straight nigga shit how we usually do. Get kicked off the tour, and uh, Biggie end up coming out here um, after Pac died. You know what I mean? Promoting the uh, Life After Death album. And I was with him three days before he got killed. You know wow. what I mean? Um, went to his hotel. You know what I mean? Give him some weed. He thought I still was a weed man. I wasn't a weed man no more. But I went and picked him something up, brought it to his hotel room. And um, yeah, we had a great powwow. You know what I mean? Literally, he was like, just him and uh, Lil Caesar was explaining like they love Pac. Like, they right. never set Pac up and all this. They mad, you know, they right. supposed to be torn and making money together, this, that, and the third. And they were just, like, open, you know what I mean? Like, just just open, you know what I mean? Like, just pouring out their heart of the love that they had for fucking Tupac. Man. Right. And I felt that it was genuine. It was like, these brothers love this dude. And they, they were telling, up, and they and they were telling the him. truth, too, now and that we look back. Yeah, and they looked up to Pac. Like, yo, right. he was the first one to do this for us. Yo, the mop, yo, remember he came to the hood with the gun? Yo, they were telling stories and shit. I'm like, they love this nigga, man. Right. They love him. So um, I leave. The party come three days later. Now, I was supposed to go to the party. I get to the party, the shit, you can't get in. It's over capacity, fire, the fire people came or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I'm driving up the street. We leaving, me and my homies, we leaving. By the time we get from Wilshire to fucking Sunset to the next party was, was at the Roxbury. We get to the Roxbury, we hearing on the radio that Biggie Smalls got shot. Oh, man. They ain't say he got killed, but they saying he got shot. We like, yo, we just left that motherfucker, huh? You know what I mean? Like, literally, like, we just left that bitch. You know what I mean? Just pulled off. By the time we got from Wilshire to motherfucking Sunset, at that, that can't be no more than five or ten minutes. About ten minutes later, right? they on the radio saying Biggie Smalls Damn. got killed. Not killed, but got shot. Damn. You know what I mean? In so, front of the yeah, Peterson man. Museum, So rest man. in peace that... to that brother, man. Yeah. Definitely. So, yeah, let's go back to that night. This is the way I see it. This is my theory through my investigation and deep dive on this story. So I believe the hit team is at the museum and they're mostly outside. So we're talking David Mack, Rafael Perez, Amir Muhammad, AKA Harry Billups, and Nino Durden, and possibly one other gentleman. Nino Durden is a little harder to prove he's there. So if we just focus David Mack, Rafael Perez, Amir Muhammad. There's witnesses that say they see them out front of the museum when people are coming in. That's where one of the witnesses spots David Mack. I have footage of the party itself that I've watched extensively. I do not see them inside at any time. Could they have been inside to scope out David Mack, Rafael Perez? Absolutely, okay? But I believe they're outside. As this night's going to end, it is set in motion it is planned with radios or scanners or whatever they want to use that there, there's going to be a shooting very similar to how Tupac was killed, car to car, okay? I believe the car is already outside. Now, there's a black Bentley that looks a lot like an Impala, which is strange, and I almost thought it was an Impala. It's actually a black Bentley that's sitting on Fairfax, which is where they're going, but it is not the vehicle. I believe the vehicle is parked up the street a little bit more and is never seen on film. So we see this black Bentley right by the exit where they're gonna come out, but I believe that the other car we don't see on tape and it's up in the fire lane, we'll call it, or the shoulder, okay? Now, Gene Deal says when they're exiting, there's two vehicles, one's gonna be Puffy in the first one, and Biggie's gonna be in the second one. He sees a man in the bow tie, blue jacket, blue bow tie, walking up to Puff's vehicle while he's in it, while he's escorting them into the vehicle. Now they're in the parking garage, okay? They're not on the street yet. Gene sees him, makes a note of who this guy is, okay? And flashes a gun to show him, because he gets a bad feeling as this guy's walking up. So he wants to show them, you want to do something, I'm going to fire back, right? The guy immediately walks away. I believe that's Amir Muhammad. 
Could that be another Fruit of Islam or, or Muslim Brotherhood um, member? Nation of Islam, yeah. M Nation of Islam, sorry. It's possible, okay? Could there be multiple guys dressed like that? It's very possible. But let's just focus that that is Amir Muhammad, a.k.a. Harry Billups, because Gene Deal picks him out of the lineup that Nick Broomfield shows him in New York and says, that's the guy. And he's shocked. Like, why, why are you showing me and not the police? That's why Nick Broomfield's genius has to be, come into play. That's the scouting has begun, okay? Which vehicle are they going to be in? Amir Muhammad spots Puffy's vehicle, and he can also see where Biggie's going to be, the one behind him. I believe David Mack and Rafael Perez are out front on Wilshire Boulevard because they know when that shooting happens, the getaway's going to rip. He's going to take a right onto Wilshire, and right there, David Mack and Rafael Perez are going to stop anyone from either walking over there, they can get in front of somebody's car. If they're going to try to chase, they were chased. Somebody did chase them and didn't catch them, okay? And I believe they're set, whether they're on the radios, that stuff, we, it's hard to prove all this, but there is some coordination of this is it here once he comes out. Now I believe Sean Combs is the initial target and I'll tell you why. Gene Deal tells the driver he's in the vehicle with Sean Combs. He says, blow these next three lights, don't stop. He felt, he knew there was something was gonna happen. Okay, he tells the story too. They blow the light, the car's already there. There is no drive up. So the car's parked, the, the, the Impala, the black Chevy Impala, it's parked. And in that car is the shooter wearing a blue bow tie and a blue jacket. Little C's says he saw a man in a blue bow tie and blue jacket stick his arm out the window at Biggie. Little C's is in the car. Okay, he's in the second car with Biggie Smalls. When Sean Combs does not stop at that light, target one moves on. Now here comes Biggie and he stops and sits there like a duck on a pond. Pop, pop right there, okay? I believe the shooter, the trigger man, is Amir Muhammad, a.k.a. Harry Billups. So Amir Muhammad was not only the initial spotter, but was able to rendezvous in that car. He spots him. His car's already parked. And whether Perez is watching it for a second, if any cops come up to it and go, this car's got to move, badge. See, so they're sort of like the lookouts, right? They're not the trigger man. They're the lookout. They're the, the control, right? Damage control. If somebody tries to get, tries to stop the getaway vehicle, they'll step in. LAPD, LAPD, move your car, right? And they'll happen to let the black Chevy Impala that David Mack owned, and that we have a photo of Amir Mohammed standing beside a black Chevy Impala, the exact year and make and model. And so it's coordinated, right? And I believe he had enough time to walk to the garage. He's strapped, he's, or the gun's in the car, sitting in the console, whatever it is, right? He walks up, he's gotta spot him. He's his own spotter, because he's got LAPD coordination. He's like a free bird. Yeah, he gets scared when Gene Deal shows him the gun. Sure, whoa, okay, cool. You know, he pretends like, and guess where he walks? Straight to the car. And it, man, I looked at the photos of this, the bullets in the Suburban. <laughs> and, if, and I've done this in some experiments for this story. I've pulled up to people in a car. Man, you're four feet from them. I could reach out and touch you. If I pull up next to your car and you're sitting in the passenger seat in a two lane road, you and I could high five, okay? So think, if he just comes over like this, I mean, we're talking point blank range, pop, 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 gone. Right, 
So they had to be in motion. They couldn't, they, they couldn't just do this in a walk-up fashion. There's too many witnesses. The place is crowded at capacity. You gotta have a getaway vehicle. You gotta be able to burn rubber and you have the police there to stop vehicles, redirect traffic. There's probably more cops involved, probably. Okay. Do you think there's clothed PD involved? Like, there could like, be other, they have the striped shirt guy. They say, oh, who's the striped shirt guy? That could be one of the bloods. That could be a guy who's a decoy. He's standing right by the exit there. Um, so the, the trigger man is able, yes, he's got to get away, right? So it can't really be like on foot. It could have happened. Oh, my, my point was, I think they wanted to do it exactly like how they killed Tupac. This was six months almost to the day after Tupac was killed. And it is done in the same manner. Passenger seat, gun down, stopped at a light. It was not only a coordinated hit, but a message they were sending. Absolutely. That you took one of ours, we'll take one of yours. And, 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 and if we, and I think they wanted Sean Combs. And I think that, and I think Sean knew that. And the FBI was had pictures of them. They were scouting stuff. They were probably following their communications over time, all those months. They might have, the FBI was involved too at some point. They may have thought Sean Combs might have been involved in the biggie, who knows, we don't know. They could have been looking. I think, I think the, the mission was you either get Sean Combs or you get Biggie. Either or is gonna work. You either take out bad boy's head guy, right? You can't really get them both, right? Because if you, if you pop Sean Combs there, how are you going to get Biggie behind him? You're going to turn, you're going to start blast. He's going to turn into the wild, wild west. I think it was one of those two to go down. Almost like Tupac or Suge. I thought Big Boy was dead. That's what, that's what Keefe D said. Oh, you shot him? I thought, I thought Big Boy was dead. Because they didn't give a shit if they hit him. Well, so it was really Gene Deal's you know, street sense is kicking in and saying, blow those lights, man. Let's just shoot through these lights. And, and that's why Gene Deal wanted to stand on the outside of the car like JFK. And Puffy said, if you don't get in the car, you're fired. And he tells this story. He was in full security mode, right? He was. He's like, get in the car. He had to sit in the back seat. Like they made him get in the back. He was standing on the, the runner. He wanted to, like, as they were leaving, he wanted to be on the runner. Secret service. Style. Yes. Yeah. And he said, no, we don't need that look. Puffy said that. Get in the car. And he, and he goes, blow these lights. And Biggie just, he didn't blow the light. If he blew that light, he'd be alive today. Chris Todd, thank you so much for this thank you. Uh, wild wrap up here, man. Thank you very much for having me.